because the, the yeah the button okay. Button. Uh, thank you. Fantastic now. Thank you. Yeah. Can you test uh, the slides just to, to see whether they move? Yeah. Out? Okay. Good. 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 Happy. Yes. Okay. You want to go back to the to the beginning? Yeah. That's it. We're there. <laughs> I'm left-handed, so I hope my hand doesn't cross like that. <laughs> it's fine. Carol, I like yeah. <laughs> On the computer, I'm always like that. <laughs> Carol, I, don't, I, I was going to say that to her later. I was like, I love that hair. <laughs> my, my, my sister is into uh, big Afro hair, so. <laughs> I think yes, indeed. Uh, going back to my roots. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Vila. Uh, I think you're on mute. She's on mute, isn't it? Yes, I was on mute. How are you? <laughs> Hello, everybody. How are you guys? Good. Thank nice you. Be okay. Good. 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 I beg your pardon. Your name correctly. Are you Beulah? Yes, I'm Beulah. Yeah. I'm just yeah. hoping I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> are you Jelena? Yeah, Jelena. Yeah. I usually have very, very short hair, but COVID happened to everyone, and we're stuck indoors, and I'm oh, I have to do yeah. something. <laughs> I had to do oh. something without a barber. Oh, bless you. Everything else okay, apart from the hair drama? <laughs> no, um, actually, it's interesting because I lost my sister in the COVID. Oh, um, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. She's, she succumbed to COVID-19, unfortunately. Uh, oh, in the sorry beginning, to hear. Just at the start of, of, of the pandemic. So yeah. it's been tough for our family. Yeah. But I think... Um, is what it is. We're finding ourselves in these situations and uh, it's a deep, it's a place of deep introspection and really thinking about this impact. So this is so timely and I, I, I just thought, you know, we have to do something. Oh. I think we have to take it in our own hands yeah. to do something. And, and yeah. um, so I was excited to jump on this, honestly. I just thought, you know, oh. it, it starts with the oh, conversation. That's much appreciated. And, and your nurse as well, isn't it? Part of your profession. You're not professionally. I beg your pardon? I said you're a nurse. Yes, so I, I, I'm a nurse by background and uh, I work in clinical commissioning now. So I'm a systems okay. for clinical commissioning. And um, it's quite interesting seeing how, you know, we've rallied around and, uh, and how the PPE situation has, has played <laughs> out. And, and, you know, commissioners are at the heart of, of that as well. And, and um, I think there's yeah. lessons to be learned. Definitely. There's definitely lessons yeah. to be learned. But yeah, interesting stuff. Wow, very interesting. I can't wait to hear all your contributions today. I'm also here to learn so. <laughs> but it's, but yes. it's an interesting one. And I think at some point we might touch nerves a bit. It might be a little bit touchy. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've discovered that you know over time with all this conversation, some of the topics get very touchy, and some people, mm -hmm. people get you know passionate about it, and it gets to the point where it gets a bit touchy. And I like it aloud. Everyone to me is aloud. You know, as long as we're doing that with much mutual respect, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's not the most comfortable for to talk about, but it's the reality. It's our reality. So um, yeah. somehow we just have to get it out there. I just wanted to check the yeah. acoustics. I don't know whether it's me or is anyone uh, experiencing an echo? Okay. No. No. Can you, can you okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, Carol. Mm -hmm. But um, Ruth, you're echoing for some reason. You try and reduce the volume. It oh, might, okay. might do okay. it. Bear with me. I'm okay. not the most um, technically sound person, but um, somehow we're going to get there. Yeah, with me. Yeah. But I, I think it's fine. I can hear you clearly. Uh, oh, it, yeah, it's probably me. It's probably my side. I can hear you. I think there's an echo from Ruth's side. Did you hear yeah. my help? Really, out the volume or something like that. Let me yeah, take on your. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just the volume there. It's probably quite loud. Um, how are we doing for time? 
Uh, we've got three minutes to the start. Yeah. Okay, so at least um, for you guys that are here, Carol and Bula, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you okay. so much now. Yeah, just to touch base with you, we will have roughly 10 to 15 minutes, obviously, to put your perspective across and introduce yourself and put your perspective across. And then uh, there will be possible questions uh, from the audience and possible questions from me. So I will put across some questions and you all take turns in answering it. And then uh, possibly Dennis, who is my co-host, would help with the questions from the audience as well towards the end. Uh, and I'm aware that, okay, Sharon is not there yet. I think Sorry, could you recap on? Could you don't mind? Could you recap on the etiquettes, please? Could you could you just recap on that? Because I I, okay. I didn't quite hear a little bit there. Okay, sorry. I said um, we've got five of you, I guess, um, on the panel today, and you have ten to fifteen minutes um, to just introduce yourself and give your perspective on the topic mm -hmm. we're discussing today. And then obviously I'll come back um, at you with possibly a question or just for you to elaborate more on any particular point I picked out from yourself. And then towards the end as well, Dennis would um, chip in with questions from the audience. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I was just saying that um, I think Sharon uh, one of the panelists, she's not on yet, but she has a prior. I am, I've just, I've just arrived. Sharon is, Sharon oh, is hi, online. Sharon. Hi. Hi, yeah. <laughs> oh, I couldn't see you. Sorry, it's when you're not on yet. You okay? I'm fine, thank you. It's lovely to see everybody. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Yeah, I was just saying to the rest of the panel that you'll be leaving early, so if you don't mind, I'll kind of start with yourself. So okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, you're free to. <laughs> To leave probably since then. Is anyone else having no any issues ready to go? <laughs> no. No, welcome. Okay. Welcome everyone. Hello. Is that Bola? It is. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, you okay? I'm very well, thank you. Excited to oh, be here. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you. Did you have a good day? Ruth. Fabulous day. I'm yeah. looking at you, Jane. Six oh. o'clock we can start. So, um, All right, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay, we're starting. Are we good? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. One and good evening. Um, I want to welcome you to another webinar with One Africa Network. Um, my name is Ruth Adams. I am part of One Africa Network and with me today is my co-host, um, Dennis Aguma. Uh, just to start with a couple of housekeeping rules. If you don't mind, we'll just employ you to put yourselves on mute, just to avoid any background noise. And um, I'll start by probably running through who we are as um, African, One African Network, uh, who we are and what we do and how we do what we do. And um, I'll also introduce our speakers along the way and there'll be a session also for questions and answers. Any one of the participants who have questions, please put it through. Um, my co-host will be kind enough to raise it uh, towards the end of the um, webinar. All right. Okay. So, One Africa Network, um, just a little brief, considering those of us that are joining us for the first time. Uh, we are a member-based uh, network and we um, support or promote entrepreneurship, innovation, excellence and inclusiveness and economic growth. Uh, we're supporting the BAME community, um, those who come from BAME business background, um, including um, business professionals. And um, our mission is to connect, inspire, 
empower and celebrate people who have been successful within the BAME community. Um, our work goes around research, advocacy, consulting, and capacity development, which is what we're doing at the moment. And we're, we're currently supported by um, Innovate UK, uh, the UK Innovation Agency. And uh, these are the industries we cover, policy, economy, business growth, innovation, technology, STEM, and creative um, culture. So if you're just joining us for the first time, I know there are some participants that have been with us before. Um, but this is just to run through who One Africa Network is and what we do. And um, this is how we engage with people. We do events. Uh, I beg your pardon, I'll just go one slide back. Okay, we do events like this um, prior to COVID-19. We were face-to-face. -face. Uh, we do events. We, we organize um, a lot of series on business growth. Uh, we organize awards as well, and we've been fortunate enough to have uh, this much uh, speakers who have invaluable experience and uh, perspective to share. So these are just pictures from most of our events, and the focus today would be on COVID-19 and its impact on the BAME community. Okay, and with me to discuss that is um, Sharon Thompson. She's a councillor and cabinet member of homes and neighbourhoods in Birmingham City Council. She's a labour councillor and she's focused on policy, business growth and strategy and public relations. So welcome Sharon. It's nice to have you here. And um, with us as well, I'm not sure if she's on yet, is um, Jacqueline, uh, one of our panellists, Jacqueline Onalo. Uh, she's an award-winning uh, human rights lawyer and she is involved in leadership and development and so on. Also a board of trustees at Comic Relief. And then I also have with me um, Bola Abisogu. Uh, he's the executive director and chairman for Diversity City Surveyors. And he's been fortunate enough to also have been awarded an OBE for his um, focus and services uh, involving young adults, um, promoting diversity and inclusion. And I also have with me Biula Chizimba. Uh, she, she is also a lead nurse with Suffolk so, uh, so Health, um, Health Organization. And she's also a certified leadership coach and she's a qualified and registered nurse and also a public speaker. Um, these are some of the topics we'll be covering today. We'll be looking at why um, the BAME community has been disproportionately uh, impacted and the financial impact it's had on uh, the BAME community. And we'll also look at tackling institutional racism, uh, discrimination at the workplace, and we'll also look at inclusive growth and the way forward for uh, the BAME community. Um, I want to also say that personally, this topic is uh, something that resonates strongly with me. I am very passionate about it. So I am really looking forward to, you know, engaging our panelists and also benefiting from them, having a view on their perspectives and what they, they experience and how that would help us uh, to move forward. Ruth. So I have introduced our speakers and yes. Ruth, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I think we got an extra speaker, Caroline, also on the, Carol, on the, she's also a speaker, she's on the panel. Oh. Carol Edimson. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think you maybe you missed her. Oh, okay, I beg your pardon. <laughs> All right, I'll come back to that. I, my apologies, Carol. Oh, yes. I beg your pardon, my apologies, Carol, <laughs> if you can hear me. Um, so we have Carol Edmondson, and she's a member of Business Action, Momentum and Enterprise. And she's a public speaker that believes strongly in the interrelationship between your financial health and your physical health. So it'll be interesting to hear from Carol as well. Carol, my apologies, I beg your pardon. 
Okay. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, if you'd be interested to get involved, uh, we would encourage participants who will be interested in joining One Africa Network in one form or the other, because we, at the moment, we, we are trying to promote, obviously, the BAME community, um, its strengths. We want to celebrate those who are, are, have achieved a lot within our community, and then we also want to bring of those who are kind of trying to progress within the community as well or within their field. So please feel free to get involved. You could become a member or you could participate in our event or you could sponsor the network as well. Um, and then we also offer mentorship. We offer uh, advisory for those who are struggling at the moment uh, with COVID-19. Uh, obviously we're hoping that everybody's well, but uh, we also know that people have been impacted um, either negatively or positively uh, during this COVID-19 period. So we do want to hear from yourselves if you've been impacted um, in any way um, and you think you need our help either in terms of mentoring or in terms of business um, advice, if you just need a little advice or if, if you feel like you need a little bit more time with someone to talk you through things, uh, we, we offer that. And as I said earlier, we're supported by um, Innovate UK on this um, particular uh, project. Okay, so without waste um, spending you know, most of your time, I'll just go straight on. I think um, I would welcome Sharon, who is our first panelist. Uh, she's going to be giving us her view, obviously on how um, her perspective on the impact Thank you very much. COVID-19 on uh, the BAME community. Yeah, and um, you're welcome, Sharon. You've got your turn. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to speak. I just want to say how wonderful it is to see this network actually taking place because this is what helps us to move forward as communities and make sure that if we ever get an impact of a pandemic of any kind again, that we'll make sure that we're equipped to deal with them because we're getting research, information and we're sharing amongst ourselves. So um, as the chair said, I'm the cabinet member for homes and neighbourhoods in Birmingham and that covers housing, bereavement services and the localisation agenda. Now, through my portfolio, I saw a huge impact when it came to COVID-19 and the BAME community, specifically through the housing portfolio and also through bereavements. Um, when it comes to, um, I would say, the housing portfolio side of it, I think there's huge links for particularly BAME communities when it came to the spread, when it came to actually combating against those that showed symptoms of COVID-19. And the reason for this is also around the fact that the family structures often in BAME communities, you will find there is a lot more of intergenerational living amongst BAME communities. You will find that we have, sometimes we have larger families, so sometimes we're finding that people didn't have the means to socially isolate if they came up with the symptoms. So those were some of the things that we were seeing as some of the pressure points. And also in some particular communities where there was cases of overcrowding and they needed new or they, they needed better housing, it was much more difficult, particularly type of the um, streets and neighborhoods that they were living on. And ultimately with some communities, we often find that they live in particular areas where we can connect with each other as, as, a, as a diaspora sometimes, and that was having a huge impact. Now, um, another side of my actual portfolio is the bereavement services. And I was quite vocal at the beginning of the lockdown because I really believed that the government should have um, started to record the infection rate of COVID-19 based on figures around gender, ethnicity, and also um, age, because that would have helped us to profile different communities that were being disproportionately affected and see it a lot earlier on and target those communities when it came to communications and making sure that we were using the right type of communication methods. We know within our communities, we have a lot of our own media, and I don't mean social media, I mean broadcasting channels, whether that's newspapers, and also those things around um, television channels. So if we kind of marketed towards the audiences of the communities in a language that the community feels and that we resonate with that touches the hearts and minds, I genuinely feel the information would have got out in a much speedy way and it would have been connected 
people would have connected to that and for it to resonate. So that was really important for me. It's quite interesting that over the last week that the government has now produced a paper and it is based around COVID-19, understand the impact of BAME communities. Now, when I looked through the paper that's been found and you can find it on the government website, a lot of it was the things that we thought we would have saw, which was along the lines of, we know that there's an issue, we're not quite sure, BAME communities are further affected than others. And I think there needs to do a lot more research around that, looking into it, but ultimately around the social economic factors that are linked to communities, the financial vulnerabilities of certain communities, particularly in the BAME community, and also the occupational risks. So we know there's a lot of people who are working on the front line, particularly in the NHS, who historically, that's a great service that we find that BAME communities often contribute towards. We also have to not forget about the fact that we do suffer institutional racism within different structures. And were people being supported in the way that they should have been supported compared to other people? There is a lot of unconscious bias out there. And I think that's something that often isn't talked about, but it is ultimately connected to the way that we were impacted when it came to COVID-19. Um, I also think that um, we need to continue to press forward with it, but ultimately, as communities, one of the key things that we need to do is actually to do our own analysis around it, but also now look at how, what are the opportunities moving forward and how do we address that? Because one of the things that comes out of COVID-19 when it comes to bank communities is it really did, because it has been such a intense and fast pacing environment, what's really happened is it's flushed up inequalities at a much bigger pace. The impact on families, children being able to access good doctor care and surgeries and things like that. And also looking at in the future, what are we supposed to do when it comes to the emotional well-being of people within our communities because there are some things that are going to impact us right now in the here and now but some things are going to come further down the line many families communities from bank communities african and caribbean the way that we mourn alone our loved ones we are very much into fellowship we work together we support we spend time around each other we've not been able to do that because of some of the restrictions that have been put on on, on places in terms of where how many people can attend a funeral, how many people that can gather, that has a huge emotional impact on people. So those type of things we really need to be addressing moving forward. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me Sharon? Yes, I can, I can. Thank you so much for that uh, perspective. Um, if I just want to come back on with you on uh, one of the things you mentioned about the inequalities, from your experience, what exactly, where do you think the inequalities is more prominent? So um, when it comes to dealing with the BAME communities, I was going through the, the work that um, the government had produced on the impact of COVID-19 on the BAME communities. And most of what was talk talked about was how there was this issue of the race impact, the, the age, the demographic, things like that. They avoided things like all these in inequalities you're talking about, most especially when it comes to, uh, most especially when it comes to issues of, um, say, for example, your occupation, okay, the, the kind of occupation that the BAME community find themselves in. Uh, obviously, it's not the same with, for, for example, their own white counterparts. So what would you say about that? What, what, what's your perspective on that? Um, more about the, the inequalities, what, what, what's prominent? What's more prominent about the issue? So I think, I think one of the prominent things is definitely linked around, yeah, when it comes to inequalities, I think the key things are going to be around health inequalities and actually that we're more prone to things okay. like diabetes and other things like that. So I think that's very key, yeah. but I think it's very easy for people just to pigeonhole us around the actual health side of it. The other side of it, I think is very prominent, has to be around the occupations and the type of occupations, particularly those who are on the lower end of um, social economics when it comes to maybe those that are working on the front line. I think that um, the government haven't really picked up enough on some of those key factors. So when we're looking at things around PPE, 
were they being evenly distributed to the people that really needed them on the front line? Not always. When we're looking at the support systems that they have in place, I think there's a denial that there's a link between unconscious bias yeah. and the workplace and the way that people are treated in between that. And I think yeah. that needs to be addressed and picked up as well also. I don't think that they've spent enough time actually going into communities and spending time with different communities from diasporas. Yeah. And I also think that the biggest danger when it comes to um, co the, the challenge of COVID-19 actually is the overuse of the term BAME. Now, I think the overuse of the term BAME is quite problematic because in between those different BAME communities, we all have different, different challenges. So particularly you'll find with the um, Asian um, community, theirs is more about the intergenerational living. So that will impact them more. Um, um, issues around the Black African Caribbean communities. We're talking about more about the occupation and other areas like that. So I think there's huge disparities there. And I think it's something that they're not properly picking up on. Okay, thank you very much. And then I was going to ask you just um, lastly, what's the way forward for from the bank community? What from the bank community? What's the way forward? What would you say is the way forward? I think um, so. So I think when it comes to the way forward for the bank community. Um, having watched not just COVID-19 but other issues that have been coming up recently when it comes to inequalities, um, I really do think that as communities we need to better self-organise at times. So we need to really be linking the different professions and basically what you're doing here, we need to do that more often in different areas, linking the academic research into the different um, occupations and also making sure that we're equipping ourselves to lobby in the right way and make sure that we're in positions to make influence and change because sometimes we're really good on lobbying in one area, but actually we need to have people around the seat of tables to bring through those discussions for us. I think we need to do a real good study of what is happening, but we also make, need to make sure that we're channeling to the consultations that are taking place, but also challenging some of those things. Sorry to interrupt Ruth, but I noticed that uh, Jacqueline Onalo, one of the panelists has joined us. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Jacqueline. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, I'm just conscious of the fact that um, Sharon would leave us earlier than um, scheduled. So I'm just going to come back to you again, uh, Sharon, on one last question. So um, with the issue of um, the way forward, and you're saying you, your suggestion is we should have these conversations uh, more often, and things like that. There is a problem, even with issue of well, maybe policies or the people actually making the policies. Do you think we're well represented at the top? No. I don't think we are. I don't think we are. I don't think we're well represented enough at local government and I don't think we're represented enough at national seat of policy. I think we, there's definitely a need for that. And I think when we are represented some of the time, sometimes it can be quite London centric or just one particular area, when actually the differences, are, the differences change from region to region and the way that we organise ourselves. So I think that no, we're not, best, we're not represented enough. My colleague, Councillor Paulette Hamilton has been leading on a, on, on a piece of work around COVID-19 and BAME communities yeah. and she's collecting information and evidence from communities for them to feed in actually what their experiences are because what we're finding is within government they're making top line decisions, policy decisions but when you start to get down to the ground they don't actually fit in with local communities and they don't grasp what's really happening and the effects for us. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your perspective. That's very, very informative and, you know, the insightful because obviously you come from the uh, government side of things. So we can hear a little bit because it's quite different what you hear on the media or the media and what you hear from people who are actually or practically involved with um, And I think my, my one asks... Like what you do um, in terms of... Um, and can I just say my one ask of everybody is actually to make sure that you sign up to um, updates and publication from government websites, yeah. because that's where we're getting the most up-to-date information. 
we don't we can't challenge what we don't know so i think if we do that and get ourselves more informed in the political space then that would be fantastic that's a good observation thank you for that sharon and thank you so much for thank you chair for uh, your time with us today um i'll just move on to um jacqueline onalo um just to give space for your own perspective on your contribution and what you think the challenges are um, within the BAME community and the solutions moving forward. If you could introduce yourself as well, that would be great. Thank you. No well then. Uh, good evening and thank you for having me back again. I'm Jacqueline Onalo. I'm a human rights uh, lawyer. I'm a law lecturer. I'm involved in international development, both here and in Kenya. I work within diversity and inclusion, focusing on race, gender, and age. I sit on several boards, including uh, Comic Relief, and as a result of all of this, I have devised a leadership and mentorship uh, program for BME youth to help with social mobility. So I do a lot of things, uh, but at the core of all of this is around social justice. So therefore, this particular topic, with regards to this proportionate effect of uh, COVID-19, on the black and minority ethnic communities is really important. I was really glad to hear Councillor Sharon Thompson mention about the emotional impact. I believe that we are sitting on a crisis. We are all suffering from personal and collective trauma and we don't have to wait for it to explode. There's going to be a lot of need for talking therapy, for counseling, for occupational therapy, and the time to do that is now. There are a lot of people who've lost their jobs and businesses and those that have a calling, for example, might consider um, doing causes in counseling, et cetera, to help us deal with this particular aspect uh, of the effect of COVID-19. Um, Councillor Sharon also mentioned government policy not being fit for purpose. My view is that it's not fit for purpose because often those consultations are done without us being at the table. So I'm just going to go into a quick overview of the impact of COVID-19 and what I feel that the intervention points should be. So to date, the last time I checked, there's over 42,000 deaths. And uh, British BAME community, we are twice as likely than our white counterparts to die from COVID-19. When it comes to frontline workers, healthcare workers, in the NHS, six out of 10 victims that have lost their lives are from the black and minority ethnic community. So it's clearly a crisis. And this is particularly difficult and painful for us because the NHS has a history of 78 years, a really proud history. It's a national service, but it is propped up. It has only been kept running by international workers, by the BME community. So it is really unfortunate that we have to suffer disproportionately. With regards to the reasons as to why this has happened, I think we're having analysis paralysis. We already know the reasons. The reasons are really clear. It's structural inequality, and the reason for structural inequality is institutional racism. So I am really not of the opinion of us going and doing more research and producing more reports. We need to act on the reports that we have, the recognitions that we have, and we need to act really, really quickly. So when COVID-19 started, there was this rumor going on that no black people had been affected and melanin was like some superpower. And some of us were like, yeah, maybe we're gonna escape this. But even that was a racist lens. It was trying to show us as being different. But then the opposite then happened. We began to be affected disproportionately. And then people then began to say that perhaps our genetics are inferior and there's something about our genetic makeup. And that again is a racist lens of looking at this. When we go, farther down and we look at the report. So the report initially came in two weeks ago and I'll summarize what the findings were. In a nutshell, if you're older, you're more likely to die. If you're male, you're twice as likely to die. If you're a black male, you're twice as likely to die than your white counterparts. If you come from a deprived area, you're twice as likely to die compared to those who are living in affluent areas. If you're BME, again, you've got a higher risk of dying and actually the highest risk rate and death rate has been amongst the Bangladeshi community. It is also interesting to note, especially for those who are from diaspora, that black people who are born outside the UK have got a higher risk of mortality 
when it comes to COVID-19. And of course, those who are involved in being frontline workers and working within the health system are more susceptible to death. So it is a crisis. Over 4,000 people were interviewed and spoken to. In a nutshell, they expressed anger, fear, horror, dismay, and profound grief at what we had to observe happening with regards to an issue that we are all very aware of. So we had the first part of the report and the second part of the report was suppressed for reasons best known to, to government. And they made excuses such as actually the information, the qualitative information was not there, but they were cut out because there have been numerous sessions and forums to discuss this particular issue. And some of them were recorded. So we saw in the past two weeks, various television networks basically showing that what the government was saying about the lack of information was not true. So as a result of an outcry and a lot of pressure, the report was leaked about three days ago and was then released on the 17th of June, which was two days ago, actually it was only yesterday. And the report, it doesn't tell us anything new that we didn't know, but it does have some recommendations. And as far as I'm concerned, these recommendations are just distractions and they're platitudes because they don't say anything new. So it talks about data collection and data collection on the basis of ethnicity and religion. I saw that there was a, co a comment from one of the participants on this uh, webinar who said that they're not comfortable with the term BME. Um, yes, it is problematic because if you don't collect the data on the basis of ethnicity, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Black, African, etc., then your intervention points are going to be difficult. The report also said that there had to be more research, and that's what I mentioned. The research has to be more participatory, so we have to get involved in that research to actually begin instigate the research ourselves. The recommendation was for a law to ensure that there's risk assessment. A majority of people who died within the NHS and out of the NHS or from the BME community was because of lack of risk assessment to see if they were more vulnerable. And then something about uh, culturally sensitive information. The councillor said that the information is on the website, but that information should perhaps be in more than one language, perhaps should be audio, et cetera, to allow people for whom English is not their first language to be able to access this information. Then the report speaks about tackling racism and discrimination without giving any particular details. So they've said all of this without saying the way forward. What the Prime Minister has then gone on to say that by the end of the year, there will be a further investigation. The terms of that investigation or that inquiry have not been disclosed to anybody. As far as I am concerned, and many of us who've been watching this very carefully, there's sufficient data, sufficient recommendation. All that we need to do is to act. When you think about racism and how it has manifested itself in terms of COVID-19, I will deal with the NHS first. So uh, I know numerous people that work within the NHS because the work that I do around race, I do it within NHS Trust. Numerous people were forced to work when they're unwell. They were given the most risky jobs, so you'd find them at emergency care and in COVID wards, whereas the white counterparts were in less risky wards. Why did this happen? Because BME people and Black people are less likely to complain about being put in these risky positions because they fear reprisals. In the beginning, we were denied testing. So there was no testing. There's also lack of risk assessment. And risk assessment can be questions about what are your underlying health issues. So if you've got underlying health issues, you should not be in the forefront. You should be able to do something that is a less risky position. There were no inquiries about what kind of households that NHS staffs came from. Did they come from, for example, multi-generational homes, whereby there were people who were older who were shielding, people who had long-term existing uh, health issues? Did they come from overcrowded uh, homes? All of this was not done. A lot of NH uh, Black NHS uh, staff members were not given PPE in the beginning. When they were given the PPE, the PPE was insufficient. Some managers were actually refusing to give PPE because they were hoarding it because the offering was going to run out. And further scandal, the PPE did not fit because it has been designed for the average white man. If as a member of the NHS, you can clearly tell that I am not the average white man. Bear in mind that a majority of the NHS staff are actually BME. 
And then there's a culture of disbelief, and not just with the NHS. When you search your own well, people don't believe you. It's the same for black people. So we suffer a high mortality rate when we go to deliver in hospital because people do not believe us. So when they complained about being unwell, they were simply not believed. And this is what led to the death rate in the NHS being 60% BME. 88% of those 60% was owing to something called occupational exposure. Not pre-existing health conditions, occupational exposure. All the things that I've mentioned about the risky roles and lack of PPE or insufficient PPE. A majority of people who passed away were within band five and band six. And those that know the NHS, these are the people, this is where largely black and minority ethnic people are stuck. The NHS is known as the snowy peaks of the NHS because the top tier of leadership is white. So that just goes to show you the crisis and the impact. And apart from the impact of COVID-19, within the NHS and outside the NHS, people were still facing racism before this pandemic. And this racism, for example, would mean that you would ask to, uh, to get time off to go and do professional development and you'll be denied the time off. Or you'll be given the time off when you had to go for classes, then they'll change the rota. I know this firsthand because I know some of those students and when they can't attend lessons despite signed agreements saying that they can go for further training. When people are passed off for promotion, then we're stuck between bands five and six. We are more likely than our white counterparts to have grievances brought against us. When we bring grievances ourselves, they're not taken seriously. We are ignored in meetings. We're not consulted with regards to decisions that affect us directly. We have racist abuse from patients and we have racist slurs from our own colleagues. We are bullied, we are harassed, we are undermined. And to top all of that, we are forced to snitch on fellow BME people because the NHS says that those who don't have permission to stay in the UK cannot receive treatment unless except in emergency care. And what happened during COVID was really, I don't know what words to use, it was incredible, it was, it was just appalling. People were being denied treatment because they did not have immigration status and sent back home to die or their treatment delayed. And so this is part of the racism that we're speaking about. And people will often say perhaps we are exaggerating the position with regards to structural inequality and racism, but racism kills. And although I'm not from a science background, I'll explain how this happens. We have something called uh, telomeres and telomeres are attached to the end of our cro chromosomes. What happens to, to the telomeres is that when we are under stress and pressure from all the things that I've described that are racist, we get stress. When we're stressed, our telomeres, they decrease in size and that reduces our mortality. There is the direct link to racism killing us during COVID and actually before and after COVID, if we don't do something about it. So we all hear this expression, black don't crack. Thank God, hallelujah for that. We look a lot younger than we are, but we are cracking on the inside. So for black women, we have the same age in terms of chronology, but our biological age is 7.5 years more than our white counterparts, based on what I told you regards to our suppressed immunity with the telomeres. So this is racism killing us directly. The mitigation, what should we do? So, you know, if you've been on this uh, webinar, you might be thinking it's a bit down, but there's some practical things that we can do. Mm -hmm. We need to tackle this at pace. The time is now, not more reports, not no more investigations, not more inquiries. We need to do this now. We're able to build the Nightingale Hospital within two and a half, three weeks. Why can we not deal with this issue now? Racism is age old, it's been going on for centuries, so we must act and we must act at pace. We must have robust collection of data based on ethnicity, not BME, Black, Pakistani, Asian, Chinese specific, so the intervention can be fit for purpose. We must increase representation at all levels of society, within healthcare, within the corporate sector, within politics, education, all spheres of society, we must be at tables of power and influence. I mentioned about risk assessment. 
there has to be funding. All of this requires money. So at the moment, uh, COVID-19 suffers racism and Black Lives Matter has accelerated it. Everybody and their mother is giving money. So that money better be used carefully to mitigate racism. There must be a commitment. Government does not seem like they really want to deal with this. So let's work with the organizations that we work for and we work with to challenge this particular thing. The biggest thing about racism is that there's the overt racism whereby people are killed, the outcomes of the judicial system, but a lot of it is the covert racism. It's the day-to-day -day behavior, the microaggressions. And so this must become intolerable. So that when we see it, we call it out and we no longer stand for it. I could talk about history. The reason why black people are undermined and looked at as less is because of what is in our history books. So history has to be rewritten to show the good, the bad, and the ugly. So yes, I'll give it to everybody. Churchill did not defeat the Nazis. He helped defeat the Nazis. But Churchill, in Kenya, I come from Kenya, I'm Kenyan, was responsible for over 140,000 Kenyans being murdered, raped, suffering gross human rights violations, being imprisoned, and their land being stolen. So let's tell the whole story a history whereby black people are always looked at as less. I can see that my moderator is looking at me. I am going to rush through. So there has to be prevention <laughs> in education, in health, in employability, in academia, in all spheres of society. Let's deal with all the inequality. I think I might stop for a moment. Uh, maybe during the Q&A, I will share some ideas about what our white allies can do and what we as black people must do because no one is coming to save us. It's you and I. So we must lead this. I've been speaking for a while. I think I'll pass it back to the chair and we will see how the conversation evolves. Thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, uh, Jacqueline. We will definitely come back to you. But um, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass the audience on to Carol. Um, Carol, could you please introduce yourself um, and then give us your perspective within the next 10 minutes? if you may, on um, the challenges you've observed or experienced and, and what the way forward for us. Thank you. Okay. Hi, and thank you for inviting me onto the panel. I'm Carol Edmondson. I am a public speaker. I, my interests lie in health and nutrition and also in helping people to get on the journey of wealth insurance through saving gold. But I'm also a core member of the Business Action Momentum Enterprise. And the role and the aim of the organization is to create a business support service to, to sustain and encourage economic growth and development to the BAME business and community. To accommodate new and established businesses in a forum where the BAME entrepreneurs can interact and grow their business. We have a website and one of the things that I'm coming from a different perspective. So sometimes when I hear COVID and the age related, I will be 65 this year and I know I'm able-bodied. So when I hear <laughs> that we're going to do things to protect the older ones, I'm like, I'm not staying in my house unless I am, um, obviously I have gone ahead with the stipulations, but when I hear 70 year olds have to stay in their house for three months, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> but, you know, um, I can understand why disproportionately um, the NHS staff have been impacted in the way it has been because of, as has been mentioned, the bandings, and the roles of those workers on the front line, they are pushed forward. So I can understand why the disproportionate numbers. Also, um, when we talk about our economic issues, and that's why I'm so passionate about the financial insurance side of things. Um, but one of the 
positives, if you can consider a positive out of COVID, is that we are finding certainly in the business action momentum arena, that businesses, black businesses are actually coming together to support one another more than ever before. So it's forced us to think of different ways of working and diversifying, which has been really a bonus. And it's a shame it's taken this long, but it has challenged people to think differently about how they run their services or how they sell their products or what else can we do? We can't do it this way, so how can we do it in another way that will be beneficial to our community? So we have more and more now black owned um, websites, we have groups on our BAME website, we have about 200 merchants on there. So it's a way of, we need now to understand the opportunities, and I mean opportunities, they are out there, but it's a case of looking for it, it's a case of collaboration, and not looking at each other in a competitive way, but how can we work together to actually bring ourselves up from the negativity. We don't have to be victims. We choose to be victims, but we don't have to be victims. You know, we do not, uh, we do not have to allow our past to define us. And this is an area where I feel, as you can tell, very passionate about. I have a son who's just completed university and you know, what is there? He looks at things differently from, from myself. He's not been through what we have necessarily been through because of our age. So he is blinkered in that way. And one day his eyes will be opened. But in the meantime, you know, how can we nurture our next generation of professionals? More mentoring. If you have a skill, we need to broadcast it. We need to promote it. And tackling institutional discrimination and workplace racism in businesses is something that we need to take responsibility for as an individual. You see it happening to you once, don't let it happen the second time without reporting it the first time. Keeping stringent records. Yes, it's a battle, but that's where we need to be talking to each other to get the support and the help that we need. Um, so, you know, that is Sharon, role of government, and I know you specialize in housing, but I thank you for the feedback that we've had from you, um, which has been very, very, um, not just thought provoking, but I know that as part of the Jamaican diaspora, the um, Business Action Momentum have put a report together and sent it to Matt Hancock, re-COVID and George Floyd situation. I haven't seen a copy of it yet, but the chair of the uh, Business Action Momentum Group has told me that has now gone forward. Um, and as a BAME organization, we are encouraging surveys and we're in the process of collating surveys on what the situation is. Um, also, our chair is the chair of the Black Workers, Unison Black Workers Group, uh, Jennifer McIntosh and also Black Relations Officer. She, so she definitely has her fingers in the midst of everything. We're working with Aspen University as well. So, you know, there is so much that we could say about this, but from my perspective, it's how do we look at what the findings are and actually look for the opportunities that we can, we have got a voice, we need to use it, but it needs each one of us to do that and encouraging our connections, our communities to do the same. That's it from me, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. That was very insightful as well. Um, with you raising issues about um, say mentoring in business, uh, I spoke about that earlier. Obviously, if I think we overestimate the word mentoring or we, we over exaggerate it, it just means if you have a skill, as Carol has said, within the BAME community that someone else could find useful 
all you have to do is put yourself forward and you know be available to that person who needs that help that's all it means it's, it's not saying you have this massive shoulder of responsibility on yourself that you have to deliver it's just you know guidance it's just you know advice you know of a better way forward or more enhanced way forward so it's just nice to see that um carol has raised that issue about um we supporting each other the BIM community businesses were supposed to buy from each other we're supposed to patronize each other those are things that we are, are promoting those are things that we're commit, committed to um, instead of you know patronizing other people from other ethnic communities we could patronize ourselves we could promote ourselves we could support each other so thank you very much uh, for that carol that's very very useful uh, to highlight that bit uh, I'm just going to move on now in the interest of time to Bola Abisogum. Um, he's going to give us a different perspective now coming from um, professional, as a professional surveyor. He's going to give us, you know, the perspective from, you know, that side of things, that industry, just, just to mix it up a little bit. Um, you've got the audience. Welcome, Mr. Bola. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And I, I have to say, um, thank you, Eugene, for reaching out and inviting me, and obviously, Chair, kind of introduction. Um, I, I've got to say, I've been moved by the presentations so far. Um, very informative, very passionate, um, quite detailed, and I find myself now digressing from what I was originally going to talk about, but I think I'll keep it um, focused on, on professional uh, perspective. And... You know, there are elements of all previous conversations that I could overlay within my delivery. But I did say to Eugene, I want you to talk about um, the implications for the Bain community in construction and real estate. And I'll restrict that to construction um, because I think, as we can all see, um, the built environment at the moment is being challenged in a number of different ways. The common denominator with uh, the, the resonation with Councillor Sharon's piece is the housing piece and the lack of it across the country. Um, and within that, the procurement of how those projects will be delivered and the participation of the bank community, which historically has been barren uh, or very little at best. Um, so as a child of quantity surveyor, I'm the founder and chairman of Diversity Surveyors. And we are essentially the first BAME network for the World Institution of Chartered Surveyors. And I take on board fully the comments made about the term BAME, and I, I totally agree. Uh, I just think that in surveying, BAME actually works insofar as demonstrating that it means everything non-white, largely, and in particular, Black and Asian. Um, so we are the authority on the BAME experience in surveying with a global perspective. Um, I'm based in London. I'm a charter point of as a practitioner. And um, essentially, I wanted to give an overview of some of the issues that I've been discussing with colleagues and clients over the last three months, and specifically um, BAME surveyors, and in particular, black surveyors. And so many of us historically have been challenged on the career progression ladder inside the profession. So many of us have become independent practitioners as a consequence of that for all of the reasons that Jacqueline mentioned uh, regarding the institutional processes that underpin many professions, including surveying. Um, but from a practitioner perspective, I think there are four areas I wanted to just address briefly, um, and they could apply to any business across the country. Um, so cash flow, risk management, people, and digital maturity. And the cash flow piece is quite obvious. Um, what is your net cap position? How do you protect the money that you're owed? How do you continue to earn and sell your services as a professional? How do you protect being paid? Because at the moment, many clients are technically insolvent. In fact, the entire construction sector, some would say is insolvent. And the only client we're talking to at the moment is the government. The government is also challenged financially. So the entire landscape of financial probity is under pressure. And you can overlay that with the institutional processes that make payment to paying businesses generally harder, and in particular, surveying, which is um, quite challenging anyway. Um, I've also tried to overlap the entire conversation around risk management 
Now, risk management as a business, whether you're a contractor or a surveyor, is absolutely critical. The biggest challenge at the moment is visibility of your risk profile. Understanding what your client's positions are, what your supply chain's positions are, what the general uh, sentiment of the economy is going to do, the huge uncertainty relating to interest rates and finance. Um, it's an absolute nightmare, but there are still pockets of hope uh, and clarity if we look hard enough. Um, so my question to many businesses is what processes at the moment do you have in place to protect your business uh, from a risk management perspective? And if, if it is overwhelmingly out of sync with your um, expectations, many businesses I know are opting to fail. They're choosing to leave the sector. Why? Because of all the compounding pressures. And that's a disappointment. To do that well, to define your risk profile well, you need to understand uh, your limitations as a person and your limitations as a business. You also need to look at the people that you work with and that you employ, if you do. And again, here, an opportunity that has emerged since the uh, evolution of the lockdown is the need for new skills. I'm 26 years in as a post-qualified chartered surveyor. I'm actually at the moment constantly reviewing my own skill set. I do not believe at any point in time that I am skilled enough. And as a BAME practitioner, talent isn't enough to stay in the game. It's one thing that we don't have um, at our privilege, and therefore we constantly need to redefine what skills are required to compete in the market. This brings me to the real opportunity that I see emerging, which is both digital maturity and new business models. Now, the whole notion of a new business model for those that have been practicing for ages could be quite challenging in terms of what does that look like. But what I would say, or how I would frame that, um, is to look at what you've been doing as a professional or as a business for the last 10, 15 years, and trying to identify what actually doesn't work anymore, what doesn't pay well, what is now technically redundant, and what could be infused into your business to make your business operate in a more meaningful way. Digital maturity for me is an inevitable occurrence for most businesses in construction. Technology is wiping out inefficiency, which is good. It's also wiping out competition for those that recognize it, which is even better. But it, it takes no prisoners for those that can't see the opportunity for what it is. And I, I, I warm to the point made by Carol, who mentioned that Bain businesses tend to be collaborating more effectively. This is a, a low hanging fruit solution uh, for those who recognize that they're strength in numbers and that we may be limited by our own skill sets. But it's something that is, in my mind, foreign to Bain owned businesses, largely because of the threat of competition. Um, but the new business model scenario is something that we need to think about. And, and to do that well, we also need to appreciate current government thinking and government intervention. So all of what I've said today actually hinges on successful procurement processes. And public sector procurement in particular is challenged and stacked against vain businesses. But this is an area of focus that I particularly am looking forward. And I really want to throw that out to the audience and the other panelists in terms of understanding what their own positions have been or experiences have been regarding challenging public procurement as a process and recognizing that it makes no real allowance for the differences that Bain businesses find themselves in. And I will refrain from using the word institutional racism, but the fact is the procurement processes themselves need to be challenged and questioned around difference and whether it caters for that. And with regards to difference, that leads me to my last point around social value and inclusive growth. And if we really are going to look at um, a solution for the BAME community moving forward, the government mantra will have to change in a meaningful way around inclusive growth and social value. Social value being the, the almost natural outcome of engaging local businesses at a local level with a particular emphasis on, on non-white and BAME-led entities. And I'll stop there for now, just to give the panelists and the, the audience a chance to, to participate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that perspective. That was very informative as well. Um, I am expecting some questions. Um, obviously, my co-chair 
or my co-host will be helping with that a little later on. So I encourage all participants to pull out their questions. If you want to direct it to any panelists in particular, uh, feel free to do that. Um, hopefully we have time enough to entertain some questions. Uh, but without wasting much time, I'm going to pass it on to Bula because I'm very interested in having her own perspective. Um, coming from a health background, it would be nice to um, hear what she's got for us. Over to you, Bula. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join this webcast. I think it's so timely and the agenda that we have tonight is something that is really important in our community and I'm so glad that we've all come to the table to have these conversations because I think as we start to look at how we can mobilize and how we can start changing our communities or rather um, starting to look at what what, is, what, are, what are our strengths in our communities and what are the real challenges that we need to look at and to start um, maybe, you know, finding ways forward. Because I think what has been interesting for me around the COVID-19, just before I, I go into that, I just want to thank Jacqueline and, and, um, and Sharon specifically for really giving a, a, a robust um, you know, context, and actually I'm now thinking I, I, I can go halfway into my presentation because, you know, Jacqueline, you, you gave such really, really robust information around the challenges, and actually we know the challenges, and we, you know, it's out there in, in the public domain, and the issue is that we keep, and, and I think systems and, 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 and statutory services and government we keep wanting to gather more data. We have data, we know what the problems are and we're lacking the solutions. And maybe it's not just lacking the solutions, it's lacking the will to come to the table and to start mobilizing for that change that we need. So thank you for that. And, and, and on that note, I'm not going to talk specifically about the statistics because Jacqueline and Sharon have covered them and thank you so much for the other uh, speakers, Carol and Bola who've given those different perspectives. And I really want to um, look at some of the strengths of where COVID has shown us in terms of children. So uh, as a professional in introducing myself, my name is Bila Chizimba and I, I, I have two career interests in my life. And I, and I talk about them uh, being my project. So I'm a, I'm a nurse, I'm a designated nurse and I work for clinical commissioning groups and uh, I work in children's services and systems. So, you know, I'm leading in those systems under quality improvement, and quality management and change management. So that's really my expertise. And I have a real passion for empowerment for professionals and workforce development. And that's the other half of the work that I do in terms of leadership development in, you know, in, in, in my own leadership development company for women and specifically serving women in public service. And there's a reason why I, I, I decided to do that because being a woman working in public service myself, seeing those challenges of how to go, get ahead, you know, how do you qualify as a nurse and how do you move up? How do you uh, get into a senior leadership position? So it's something that obviously, you know, I've done and I, I, I felt empowered to, 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 to bring somebody else up and to look at how I can do that within my own capacity as a leadership development coach. So, Looking at the perspective of children, because the narrative of children is lacking within the COVID-19 discussion. I think, you know, um, in our discussion today, we have, uh, uh, it, it, it's clear we, we bear the brunt of the consequences of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. But there's one real strength in that children are actually quite um, resilient. And with the COVID-19, I'm just going to uh, ask, uh, I'll probably put it on, on onto the chat later, but I want to signpost people to uh, the Royal College of Pediatrics, uh, a report on COVID-19 and impact on children. And actually the fact that children and young people, it is, there's been very rare evidence of children becoming unwell. So what does that say to us as, uh, as a BAMI community? 
it means that there is strength in our children right now where they are, their health, and how can we, in becoming very much solution focused in the way I'm going to approach this conversation, is how can we ensure and how can we safeguard that strength? Because we know that the older population all the underlying health issues that stem from the foundation of racism and inequality. And I think we're all clear that that is the foundation that's permeating and is almost like a golden thread that is running through everything that is a problem right now. So we, if, we all, if we agree that it's racism, and I certainly believe that it's racism and the inequalities that are the bedrock of everything else that is happening. So if we know that, and, and we know that, you know, the population of, of adults who have succumbed and died, what can we learn from that? So our children and young people are healthier. They, how do we get them from this stage to becoming healthy adults? How are we modeling the behavior of health? How are we modeling going to the gym, eating healthy in our Bami homes, and continuing to, um, you know, to, to, to work within our cultures and to work within the way we live our lives as, 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 as immigrants in this country. So that is something that I really wanted to bring up and to make sure that, you know, it is on our radar, that there is a strength in our community in our children. And they are actually our future. And they're the future professionals. They're the future, you know, BME professionals that are going to be uh, continuing this fight because I personally don't think that you know we are we are there yet because the issue is we're still having conversations we are still not uh, uh, you know there's still not the will I think the will is there but it's debatable in, in in terms of really being solution focused so 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 um, I think I wanted to to really stress that point and moving on into being a lot more solution focused. I want to highlight to people that we live in systems and the systems we live in are by design. So they're designed for particular people. They're designed for uh, uh, um, people who speak the language, people who I might access. So I think when I'm talking about design, I come from a background of uh, health services design. So for example, if we are designing a service, we are engaging with communities or we're engaging with the community where we are going to set up those services. And actually, if we are designing a service that we are not inclusive of a, a, a BAMI 65 year old who doesn't speak the language, there is no way that person is going to be able to access that service and uh, enable them to actually live healthy or meet their health needs in the way that they need to. So the conversation for me, in terms of really being solutioned, I have brought in some key themes that I think uh, uh, being uh, thematic in, in my solution, in my solutions, it's really around design. Are we coming to the table when we are designing services? So in terms of professionals like myself and, your, and, and you know, professionals in business, professionals working in, in all the sectors, Sharon, in housing, in, in health, in um, education, are we as black professionals advocating. So there's a thing about self-advocacy. And this is something that I've learned in terms of, um, I'm very much um, comfortable being the only black person at the table. And it's a reality for where I live in the, in the East of England. So it's predominantly white and, you know, a small cohort of uh, BME people. And I do get to sit on boards where I may be one of the only BME people. So I've learned to self-advocate. So advocate for myself and advocate for the community. And if I am the only person in that space, how am I speaking on behalf of my community? How am I speaking on behalf of the people that I know who might access this service? So, you know, I work in an organization that is inclusive. I must say, you know, um, I get to have a voice. And I think I have sometimes brought myself to the table and built that voice where we start to talk as professionals. I think this is a solution for, for, for those professionals who are working in the sectors that, that you are. If you have a seat at the table, how are you advocating for your community? How are you advocating for yourself? Because you see yourself as a patient, see yourself as a professional and see yourself as a patient, a user of services. We all go to accident emergency for ourselves, maybe with our children. 
how do we go back into the office and tell them how your experience was as a black woman with a young person, with a young child, I've been to access an emergency. I couldn't, I, I couldn't access the service in the time that I, I really needed to, I work. I have all these things. And actually there was a problem. I went with my mom, she, you know, the, there's a language barrier there. So I'm kind of really giving perspectives on how self advocacy can work. That if you are at the table, start advocating for yourself and for your community. So that is one of uh, 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 the solutions I was talking about. And in terms of uh, workforce development, this is a real key issue. And we know from statistics and the work that has been done by the uh, uh, race equality um, uh, service that is being run at the moment in the NHS, that a lot of BME professionals, when we are immigrants, we come into the country and a lot of nurses came into the country directly recruited from Africa. And some have come and, you know, did their nursing here. So I, I came and I did my nursing here and then, you know, was employed in the National Health Service. So how do we, um, how does the organization support us in growing? So we know that that's a real issue. And actually it's interesting because I'm, 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 I'm writing a white paper at the moment in a, a, a my leadership business because I undertook a, um, a survey wanting to look at the real needs, the real advancement needs of BME professionals that are working in the National Health Service, that are working in local authorities. And 163 women answered that survey. And within that 163 women, 85% of those women are in a band five and a band six role. So these are entry roles in the NHS. And they have been in these roles for 10 to 15 years. They've been, and, and in 10 to 15 years, you can progress your career into a director position. That's the reality for somebody in the same position who might not be from a BAMI background. So that's the reality and seeing it that way. So it's really about agency, building agency in professionals. How do organizations build agency? And how do you yourself as a professional build your leadership so that you can negotiate for your own needs? So you can communicate those needs to your employer. So you can actually influence on your own behalf and on behalf of anyone else who might be coming, you know, into the, into the health service or, you know, the sector you're working in. So it's really, um, th th there's quite a few themes around taking responsibility for your career, taking responsibility so that you are able to, to direct it. Because I think there's a lot of, um, of, passiveness in terms of wanting to direct yourself into roles that uh, you have outgrown. Because personally, I think the professionals who are still working in that role, they've outgrown the roles, but there isn't that um, commitment from the organization itself to, in, to, to empower these uh, uh, professionals to move on. So they're moving out of the frontline face, you know, patient facing uh, organ, uh, uh, roles to the back office. So those are some of the things that I think in terms of being solution focused, how do we organize ourselves as professionals? How are we organizing our families around health, well-being, around our children and young people? How are we modeling those behaviors around being healthy, around, um, you know, ambition, around, uh, uh, you know, making yourself uh, to be the person that, that, that you want to be and the person that, you know, is in the driving seat. And I think that is something that we as professionals and we as BME communities need to mobilize around and look at how we can empower each other and mentor each other. So, you know, I think for me, those are the key things in terms of redesigning services. I'll just recap on that. Be at the table, answer calls. If you see, uh, um, if you see NHS England or, you know, clinical commissioning groups, with surveys, answer them because you give a perspective of how you will access that service. And I work in, you know, in a commissioning organization where we don't get responses from BME staff. So they may be trying to engage as well as organizations as a professional who does engagement. We do send out, uh, you know, surveys, but it's about engagement. How do we as a BME community 
engage and redesign and facilitate those, uh, the redesign of those services so that we can access them equally. And we can ask for what it is we need. If we need language line to, you know, for, for, for different languages, we need to come to the table and say, this is what we need for us to access that service, for us to improve our health and our well-being. I think I'll, I'll end on that note because I know that, you know, we are, <laughs> we, we are running really short of time, but it's a subject I'm really passionate about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mila. That, that passion seems to come through your conversation. It's, it's very interesting, some of the issues you've highlighted. Um, you've, you've talked about, you know, taking personal responsibility for your development, which is one of the areas where we, um, you know, the BAME community needs to really focus on. You know, it's not going to be handed to us in a platter of gold. We have to work hard as everyone else. We have to put in the work. So it's very interesting that point that you've raised that, you know, we shouldn't just sit down and have that victim mentality. We should take personal responsibility, take the initiative to kind of move our development forward. Um, because I have spoken to, you know, some of my, net, within my network, there are some people who are from the health industry as well. And just rightly, as you said, it could take someone 15 years to move into a director role. But then you see people come all the way from you know, foreign countries and just sit on the, the roles they, they, they are for like good 10, 15 years. That, I don't think that's acceptable. Even though there are genuine people who I think also make the effort to move forward. But as you said, all, all the institutional you know, things in place kind of you know, put a stop to that. So I appreciate that point of view. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna put it out to the participants now hand over to my co-host, then is um, Abuma, who's going to probably highlight some of the questions um, we've got from the participants. And I just want us to put um, another issue into perspective quickly while the panelists answer those questions. And one of the things that I've come across quite often as well is that, you know, they see Black and um, ethnic minorities or Black people in particular as a bit too loud a bit too much, they, they, they find us a little bit overwhelming. Um, I don't know, I want us to put, you know, I want to throw this to the panelists, to put this into perspective while you answer questions from the audience. Is it a mindset problem? Are we missing something? Um, is it a cultural problem? I, I'm not particularly sure because this is me, this is who I am, for example. Um, I don't think I'm too much. I don't think I'm too loud. I think I pass my message on constructively as, you know, as politely as I can. So I just want us to put that into perspective, you know, as we answer these questions. We're not going to play victim. Obviously, we're going to take personal responsibility for um, our progress, our, you know, development. But then there are all these, you know, perception that people have about our community. So. Um, I'll hand over to Michael. Thank you so much for your contribution, all panelists. Thank you. Over to you, Danny. Thank you, Ruth, and all our panelists. Uh, the passion is very apparent and obvious, and it's a shame that we only have one and a half hours. Uh, I, 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 this, this could have gone on and on. Um, so I've been monitoring some of the questions. Uh, there are two key questions. I think one was by Sally Ninza. Uh, no, they were, they were actually both by Sally Ninza, and she's talking about education and saying that she comes from the Commonwealth uh, background and that we've been told, we've been taught about the Commonwealth uh, history. So the question then was, why is there no recommendation that white counterparts should be educated on issues of cultural indifference, education and cultural intelligence for all, not just those in leadership? And I think this has come up. Uh, I think there's been a petition trying to get academia to review some of the uh, curriculum so that perhaps part of this racism, the suggestion is that it might be out of ignorance and that perhaps if people were educated, then they would appreciate more uh, the context as to how, for instance, blacks ended up in the West and the, the rich history and heritage that they've had and the, their contribution. So I wondered, perhaps Jacqueline might be able to, uh, from, from, from academia side of things, might be able to make a contribution on this. Do you think that uh, education might actually be a very important tool in, uh, in dealing with some of the challenges around racism? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mentioned during my presentation that history underpins racism. The way that we are portrayed uh, as a race that was saved 
as opposed to a race that was uh, taken advantage of. And that's really, really important. Uh, education is important and education from a young age. I really do echo what, what my colleague, Belua, has said. She mentioned about the asset that we have in our children, that they're healthy, but they're also open. So the younger that you get them, when you've gone through a lifetime whereby you have been treated as less, you might begin to think that you're less. For those who have got conscious and unconscious bias, if you've gone through a lifetime, it is difficult to have a change of mindset. But if the education system, like I said, if it is honest, the good, the bad, and the ugly, whereby it shows positives and negatives and gives a balanced view of all races, then we begin to tackle this issue called race. Because racism is really about the behavior. And then all that we've discussed is the consequences of that behavior. So I believe education is really, really key. Mm. Uh, there's been a big move about decolonization of the curriculum. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody's taking it up, but government is really pushing it, I think about only 33% of universities have agreed that they have to look at the curriculum. So we need to keep on pushing. But education does not, only, does not only happen in academic institutions. What are we teaching our children at home and in the communities? So I believe in storytelling. I believe in the power of our own stories in our own homes, how we portray ourselves. We have this beautiful art of oral literature. I don't know what your children are consuming or those within your community are consuming. So we also have a responsibility about how we tell our story. So before the curriculum changes, we have to take education in our own hands. There are a lot of community groups who are working around this, but I would encourage everybody on this particular forum and outside to take responsibility. As a system might take time to change, there's a plethora of information out there. Let's begin the education in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, whilst we push for the change of the curriculum. That's a fantastic observation, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I, I had an interesting discussion with my daughter the other day when I bought her a book that was written by an African, and she wasn't very much interested. And we had this kind of discussion, and then I realized that our children, even us ourselves, were not giving them this literature from our own community. So if we can't do that for our own children so that they understand and appreciate themselves, then when they receive the barrage from the rest of the world, they are going to find themselves in a, in a tricky situation. But then that leads me on to the next question, which I think uh, Viola might be able to answer, because this one was uh, by Anthony Kalume, uh, and he was asking that uh, the aim is to outline categorically what actions need to be done uh, at grassroots level within our communities to kind of try and address this. So I look at this from two ways. One, there are things that are outside of our control. That, but then there are other things that are within our control. So maybe within our community, among us ourselves, what kind of things could we be doing at grassroots level to try and galvanize ourselves? Uh, recently, there's been an interesting uh, Facebook page that uh, was started by a lady, I think, from somewhere in Liverpool, where black businesses are, uh, are, have you know, gone on to it, and people are sharing ideas of where these black businesses are. And slowly but surely, it has grown to about 90,000 people now sharing business ideas and trying to build this uh, black business community. Are those the kind of uh, uh, initiatives that you think are going to perhaps give us more power so that we're able to speak when we get an opportunity to sit at the table? I mean, I agree that that's one thing that we can do. But I think for me, the most powerful thing at the moment, and, and I think the key the first step is representation at the grassroots. And when I talk about representation, I mean organizing ourselves um, so we have a, a large voice. So what you see, you see the disparities in that there's one, two people here making a bit of noise. But what happens is if an, a, a group of, of people come to the table and state their views, of what is going on in that community. So really being at the table in the community. So rally around, find out in your local area which BME groups are already in place. Support them. Find the one that you're passionate about in terms of your own circumstances. So for example, some people might have diabetes. Look for a BME group that is you know, linked in with diabetes. Find a BME group that is or autism. So I think 
talking from a perspective of a, a commissioner and uh, uh, working in a commissioning organization, we, we were looking at autism services and we're looking at, we know the statistics are telling us that within uh, the next five years, 2025, 2027, there is going to be a 230% increase in children with autism and ADHD. And that doesn't exempt our communities as BME. So where are we? Where are the parents who have children with autism and ADHD? And when I sit at those tables, I don't see them. And sometimes I'm just thinking, where are they? I'm certainly looking myself, I'm you know, scouring the internet and looking at that. So mobilize yourselves, look for groups. And if there isn't one, start one. And you know, Facebook is brilliant. Start one and, 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 and tell people you are here. And when you gather a few people and you guys have a plan, you then approach clinical commissioner groups in your area, you approach the local authorities in your area and you start having conversations. You start talking about what your needs are. You start talking about how you experience services, how you experience the services that are there already. Where are the gaps? How can they, you know, how can they close those gaps? What solutions can we bring? So in terms of our own voluntary services, can we start up our own voluntary services? Can we start up our own services that, you know, complement mainstream? So those are the conversations that I think in terms of representation, for me, is the first step. We need to be at the table because if we're not there having the discussions and being represented, then I think um, we then at a back foot all the time. So we, we, we consistently behind. But if we're at the table, we're able to actually talk about what the here and now, what it is we need right now. So for me, it would be really key in terms of grassroots representation, find your groups, find your a common voice and approach. Don't wait to be approached. Approach uh, organizations. Mm, Thank that's you. a very interesting segue to then talk about organizations like the One Africa Network. Um, I've seen, um, you know, since even before COVID, one of the things that we were, uh, again, one of the things that uh, the One Africa Network really is about is having that home, that kind of community uh, where you feel at home and you're able to be supported. One of the things we uh, launched recently is a mentorship scheme where, uh, whether it's a professional level, um, whether it's a, uh, uh, at a business level, uh, one of the, some of the literature suggests, especially for black men, the lack of role models has been a significant issue in terms of how and why they end up in, uh, in, in some tricky situations. And we're trying to address that by uh, putting up a mentoring scheme. So I'd encourage all the participants that are interested uh, in being mentored or even some of the uh, panelists and um, even those participants who have something to offer in terms of mentorship to please get in touch because there are opportunities there. The other point you talked about, Bula, was about uh, volunteering. And again, we have huge opportunities for people that want to volunteer uh, in part of the grassroots activities that we are, we are running. But then this is a nice segue and possibly the last question maybe to, to Carol. There was another question that Bola would have answered around uh, accommodation and the challenges that our communities have in terms of accessing uh, appropriate accommodation. And I think as a result of that, part of what has happened with, with, with COVID has been that the vast majority of our people are living either in uh, you know, blocks of apartments and in, in environments where it is, they are susceptible. Uh, and one was asking, what is government doing about it? But I know that's a huge, white, big, hot potato that we may not resolve right now. So I'll pack that one for one second and perhaps go to Carol uh, and this issue of leadership within our community. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think uh, there are gaps in, in terms of leadership, uh, that uh, we don't have enough role models in our community and that perhaps trying to address that might lift uh, our community? Right, unmuted now. I think one of the things is we've got leadership, but they're hidden. They need to be brought to the forefront because we have many skilled people, many skilled leaders, not enough of them, but the ones that we do have, we need to promote. We need to, as I said, bring them to the forefront. It's not that they're not there, but we really need to expand. And those in the leadership roles 
yes, they need to be in the mentoring roles too. Because if we can't show what we have, then how do we expect our young people to be inspired? Who are they looking up to? Especially if they're spread few and far between. So, you know, one of my thoughts was we've got Black History Month in October. How can we make this different? How can we make it even bigger than it is with a emphasis now bringing in what we've experienced through COVID-19? How can we be... Oh, it's only just... I'm just thinking about these things and what we can do now based on what we've just experienced to make it different, to make it where we have more inclusivity and more people taking notice. That's an interesting... You know, from our... Sorry, I thought you'd finished. I do apologize for, for interrupting. But that's an interesting segue because uh, I think one of the last two events we've had uh, someone did challenge us that within our community, we must start to think about doing things differently. And I think uh, Black History Month is a very good example where, yes, the, there's lots of activities that have you know, happened during that month, but maybe COVID has thrown a spanner in the works and we need to think of how we can make the most of that. So I'm very mindful of the time and we have two minutes to the end. So I'd like to hand it back to Ruth for what has been a fantastic uh, panel and, uh, and webinar, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have been part of it. Thank you. Thank you so very much um, for that Q&A session, Dennis and the panelists. I want to quickly give one minute to Bola, if I may, just to, if you have anything to say regarding the question about the housing sector, if I may, before we go, quickly. Yeah, um, not, not much I can add other than um, there are systemic challenges. Um, you know, get your case in writing, less conversation by phone, uh, all materials sent recorded delivery, uh, reach out to local networks. Um, but, you know, be bold. More than anything else, challenge the process. A lot of people give up because they just think it's overwhelming. But challenge, challenge and challenge. And to the point about mentoring, I, mean, I do a lot of work with young black men and the mayor. Uh, of London and mentoring is absolutely critical. I've got about 35, 40 mentees at the moment, but the point is I have a relationship where they call me when they need me. So um, I advocate completely that we have to share our knowledge, share our intellectual property and just be bold. You know, the one thing that COVID has taught me as a person is that no one is in control of anything and we're all vulnerable. So we all need to lean on each other. Thank you so very much. I want to say a big thank you to all our panelists, Caro, Bula, Jacqueline, Bola, and um, Councillor Sharon, who is not with us. Obviously, she left because she had a prior engagement. Um, I have mm. I've also learned so many things from yourself. Please, please, and please, we would welcome you back anytime, any day. Don't reject our request. <laughs> We'd love to have you back. Um, it's been very, very informative and insightful to have you. And to all participants also, thank you for dialing in. Uh, please look out for our future events in, uh, from our website, www.oneafrica-network.com. Uh, please also avail yourself for any volunteering positions or mentoring positions that were said earlier, okay. Uh, thank you so very much for your time tonight and please stay safe everyone and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Well done. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.